Time to get started. <laughs> this is the uh, workshop on how to use your time. So we'd like to use our 90 minutes in the most effective way. If you have accidentally stumbled into the wrong workshop, then we're going to have a prayer in a few minutes and you can slip right on out and nobody will know about it. <laughs> For some of you, perhaps the objective of this session should be to take a nap. Uh, because the, the most important thing you can do with your time right now is to get a little rest. So we've prepared these extra benches over here on both sides. <laughs> so if anyone feels like they need to get a nap, uh, just please go ahead and step right over there. But for those of us who stay awake, our objective is to get God to teach us how to number our days. Some of you know Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And the word number there doesn't mean to count like one, two, three, but it means to weigh and allot and understand the significance of our days, our span of life, the period of time that God has given us to live and contribute to his kingdom on earth. I don't know how long that will be for you. Maybe 70 years, if by strength, 80. For John Beckendam, it was about 60-something. But all of us have a, a, a specific length of time that's as long as God wants us to have. So that's the first objective. The second is to invest some time to review the perspective on time, to deepen our convictions on <laughs> principles regarding the use of time, to rediscover some practical pointers on how to make the most of our time, and hopefully to make a commitment to allow the one who has already bought us to completely control us, the one who has bought us to have complete control and right to our time. Hopefully, we can... Uh, do something this afternoon which will help us to reduce guilt and increase joy in the use of our time. If each one of us could save a half an hour a day, and I've made a rough estimate of how many uh, people there are in this workshop, if each of us could save a half an hour a day or by somehow being more effective with the way we spend our time, that would uh, amount to about 18,000 hours for the kingdom of God between now and this time next year. So it would really be neat if we came back next year and we found out how God had directed the use of 18,000 man hours for his glory over the next 12-month uh, period. So you do see we're talking about something uh, extremely significant. Another objective for our workshop today is to, to get Jim Kennedy uh, started a little bit uh, uh, more effectively using his time over the next 12 months. I looked at the list of workshops and I didn't count those, but uh, if I numbered uh, those workshops from the one in which I'm doing the best down to the one in which I'm doing the poorest, I think this topic that they've assigned me would be the one in which I'm doing the poorest. Now, Sam Clark is sitting over here grinning because he's probably been in the same boat. It seems ironic that people ask me to do the workshop or talk on something that I'm doing so poorly at. It reminds me of the story of the banker who was going off to... Uh, speak at a banker's convention and his wife came up as he was packing his suitcase and she kind of straightened up his tie and said John I just admire you so much and uh, he said well thank you dear why, why is that and she said well because you're going off to tell all those people about how to have money and we don't have any <clears throat> perhaps the best man to ask uh, how to do something is a man who's had the biggest struggle with it and so I really feel like that. Every time I meet somebody, uh, it seems like uh, there's this little comparison going on between that person and myself that uh, he's doing better than I am in the way he uses his time. I'm continually intimidated by that, and I have uh, been intimidated in that way. Let's see. Okay, just, uh, you, let's see. Now, uh, there. Uh, continually intimidated by the use of uh, my time and the, and the uh, poor record I have in that. Then a third, uh, final objective would be that we could just tighten up the discipline in this area. It seems to me that when I tighten up the discipline in one area, it helps me in other areas. If my, if my life begins to be slack in the way I use my time, then I start to put on weight and I start having other problems. Discipline seems to come in, in, in a crowd for me personally. And so perhaps uh, for uh, many of us, we could make just a, a little tweak uh, somewhere on... Uh, uh, the use of our time and become more effective. I've been doing some uh, research and asking questions about several of the men 
who are here at the conference. And I know there is uh, one man here in our room today who always starts projects and hardly ever finishes them. And there's another man here who uh, procrastinates and keeps putting off decisions until he knows all the answers and really gets it right. There's another man here who finds himself at the whim of others. Just when he gets something figured out that he wants to do, somebody calls him on the phone and away he goes. There's another man here who keeps majoring on the minors. He gets through at the end of the day and he looks back and he sees he really hasn't accomplished anything very significant, but has kept very, very busy doing kind of minor, unimportant, trivial, insignificant things. There's somebody else here at the, in this room today who is plagued by the past. Just can't seem to make a decision and go on. Keep kind of re reliving those decisions over and over. In fact, the past will seem so present as this man recounts his uh, past suffering or mistakes uh, <clears throat> that it uh, erases his opportunity to succeed in the present. There's another man here who is pulled by various priorities. He's never quite sure what he's supposed to do at any given time because there's so many pressing uh, issues and needs for him to address and he keeps kind of shifting his priorities around and he's never quite sure what he's supposed to be doing in these areas and as a result he feels like he's failing in most of them and he probably is. There's another man in this room who uh, keeps missing appointments and he's late all the time. Well, I don't know if I, if I caught your particular situation, but just in case, I want you to turn over to page two and look there where it says, plug the leaks. And I'd like for you to read down through those and uh, put a check mark by the one that you feel personally is a leak or a potential leak. Maybe you've got it patched right now, but it's sitting there just about ready to, to uh, start leaking again. And check the one of those that's your potential most significant problem. Did everyone get a handout, by the way? There's plenty of handouts up here, about a million. With, let's see, Greg or Brad, thanks. Take a whole stack of them. There's a bunch of people back there that didn't get them. And just put the rest back there somewhere. Thanks. Pick the one that you feel like is the, uh, the biggest leak. If you've got more than one, you can check two or three, but put a big check by the biggest leak. I've got two more uh, leaks for you. I call it BB, that's between B and C. It's called living in the past. And DD is between D and E, that's called distractions. Living in the past and distractions. Picked it? Now I want you to turn to your buddy that you're sitting with, just two at a time and uh, share what that need is and uh, let him comment on it. And you've got three minutes to do this exercise.
Time's up. Don't you just love alarm clocks and the clocks and just, just to make sure we had it all right. You know, I've got, there's some guys who are just wired in for time. You know, I've got my clock and my timer and a watch on every arm and I've got some other, you know, day timer and, uh, but hopefully we've now seen the, uh, that there is a need. We've established a need uh, in, every, in every one of our lives that there's some little area in which God could just enable us. And so let's look to him now in prayer and ask him to do that. Father, uh, thank you for the, the time that you've given us this afternoon to think about time. And Lord, uh, I pray that you would enable us and teach us. I pray, Lord, for those who are already working too hard that they could free up a little bit this, this hour. For those who need to be uh, jacked up just a bit to uh, pick up the, their feet and uh, move out a little bit more briskly, I pray that you would use this hour to uh, encourage and uh, <clears throat> ennoble them. For myself, Lord, who I'm feeling a bit nervous right now doing this workshop, I pray that you would help me as well, that uh, we might learn from each other and uh, do something that would be good for your kingdom here in this, uh, in this next hour and 20 minutes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, then, let's talk first of all about perspective, and then we'll talk about some principles, and then we'll get down to the nitty-gritty, the pointers. First of all, it's, in, it's very significant to me to have the right perspective on time. As I've seen people, there are two types. One is the kind of guy who's too tight. You know, every uh, minute has to have something being done in it. I've seen people who have organized their life on five-minute blocks, and I think you can do that for about five minutes. Uh, or maybe, uh, maybe you can do it for a few hours. I've had the privilege in the navigators to uh, do something called the 2-7 training clinics. And that's about 12 hours of instruction laid out on five-minute blocks. And I don't mind telling you, it takes me about three days to get over one of those things. Because I just don't know if there are too many people who can live life on five-minute blocks. So to some people who are uh, just too tight about life, then there are others who kind of go the other way, and they're generally too lax. Now, I need to figure out where the top of that is, so, I, okay. And they haven't quite gotten around to it yet. They're taking care of number one, and, and, uh, and number two is way on down the list someplace. So I don't know which one of those groups you fall into, but hopefully today we could come up with something as a, a bit of a balance as we talk about this uh, perspective especially. Well, first of all, one of the perspectives on time is that Time is very significant. Psalm 90, verse 12, as I mentioned, says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And numbering doesn't mean to, you know, kind of click them off like you would do if you were in prison and you're trying to figure out what day of the month you're on and so forth. But it's regular, it's rather like weighing your time. I don't know how to draw a scale. But weighing the time, seeing the significance of the time, allotting the time, measuring the time. In that sense, having a sense of the value of it. Now, according to this verse, Psalm 90, verse 12, God's job is to teach us how to do that. It's a prayer. So teach us the number of our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In fact, we may gain a heart of wisdom. That's a gift also. So I don't have to learn it, and I don't even have to manufacture the heart of wisdom. All I really have to do in this matter is be teachable because God can only teach teachable people. This is a verse that I've been praying for myself that God would teach me how to number my days, how to weigh, how to evaluate, how to use the time wisely, how to have his perspective on the time. And then the second point about time is that the time is sufficient. If we can't get it done, we are either doing the wrong thing or we're doing the right thing in the wrong way. There is enough time to do everything that God wants you to do. And so if you're continually running out of time, if you continually don't have time, if you find your, your most uh, uh, frequent vocabulary, I don't have time, or I didn't have time, or if I only had enough time, then you probably are doing more than God intended you to do. And some of it comes from a kind of a, I'm an indispensable person to the kingdom of God type complex. A lot of Christians are going around with kind of the bloodshot eyeball syndrome. If they're not wrung out and tired and look like they've been up all night, they feel like somehow they're not doing 
God uh, much favor. And the problem is that God doesn't need probably all that much help from you. <laughs> Just to let you know, none of us are uh, indispensable. But some of us think we have to help poor old God out. And if we don't do this, who's going to? But the more important thing, and this is the perspective, is to get it from God what he would like for us to do. And then just do that and relax about all the rest of the stuff. And I don't know how many times I've heard someone say, yes, but if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Well, maybe it doesn't need to be done. At any rate, it's not my problem. My problem is just to do the stuff that God has already put on my plate. And to do that to the best of my ability. And then the third uh, area of perspective is uh, area of surrender. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, You are not your own, but you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I heard a story one time about some uh, medical doctors who, when they were going through medical school, they had to uh, work on a cadaver, a dead body. And uh, they had some ideas, and, and one of them had a background in electronics. So they uh, began to put some transistors and batteries and stuff in that cadaver, and they they uh, kept fiddling with it and poured perfume on it. I don't know what all they did to it, but it came to life. And it started uh, uh, walking off. And by the way, they had to pay $75 for that cadaver. I think that was the going rate at that time uh, to buy it. They, they actually bought that cadaver, and then they brought it to life. So they, the cadaver uh, started walking around and, you know, kind of looking, and he put some clothes on, and, and uh, he says, well, I'll see you guys later. I'm going on some I'm going down the street. And they said, wait a minute. You can't go down the street. You've got to stay here and do what we tell you to do because we own you. We bought you for $75. And not only that, we brought you to life. If it wasn't for us, you'd still be dead. And this is exactly the way it is with our lives relative to God. He bought us, and he brought us to life, and he owns us. Everything belongs to him. It's not like, well, I think I'll give God 10% of my time. Hey, that's real generous of you. How about 100%? It's all his anyway. And the sooner we wake up to the reality of that, the, the easier our life will be in figuring out the time. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And then the final perspective is that time is uh, slipping away. James 4.14 says your life is like a vapor. It wasn't cold enough this morning to see your vapor. Well, I didn't get up all that early, come to think of it. Did any of you guys get up all that early and go out and breathe and you can see that vapor just for a just for a second, and then it's gone. In fact, uh, if we just drew a line, let's say we started over here with eternity past. I mean, we're going to go over here to eternity future. Sort of way back there where it all started. We're going to draw this line across here until way over here until it's all over. We draw along here, and then all of a sudden we get to the time when you were born. And I'm just going to leave a little gap in there, which represents the length of your life. Can you see that little gap? That's about how big it is. So life is very brief. The life expectancy in Papua New Guinea is 39 years. In uh, India, it's 45 years. In what used to be Soviet Union, what is called Russia, 64. In the USA, 74. But you know, there's not a whole lot of difference when you look at this between 39 and 74. So life is brief, and that, that tells me that I ought to make the most use of it. The Bible also tells me that. So this is the perspective that we ought to have on time. Now let's uh, move from there and take a look at some broad principles and from there we'll look at some specific pointers. To me it's a little bit more important to get the, uh, the general direction you're going correct first and that really brings us to our first point is to know your destiny. Your, your destiny in life, what your life is all about, what God has kind of cut you out for, that, that's your framework for making decisions. The wrong question nearly always is, 
it's nearly always wrong to ask this question, do I have enough time to do it? When someone asks you to do something, it's nearly always the wrong question to say, do I have enough time to do it? The right question is, must I do this? It's just the same with your money. It's nearly always wrong to ask, can I afford this? Now, that's one of the questions you ask, but that's not the right question. There are some people who can afford things they should not buy. You, you, you get what I'm saying? And so you may, have an, you may have a little bit of time there, and someone may call you on the phone and say, would you like to do this? And the wrong question is, do I have enough time? The right question is, must I do this? For instance, let's say that you got a call right now, Mark, and Kathy was driving home from school in Louisville, and she was hit by a car wreck, and she was uh, nearly dying. Uh, you wouldn't say, I don't have time. I don't care what you had planned. You would suddenly cancel everything because you must do that. So it, it's very important for me personally. I'm, I'm speaking out of personal, uh, my personal experience. Frequently, I have been asked to do something. I say, well, I've got enough time. I guess, guess I need to do that. I guess I ought to do that. After all, they asked me. Rather than go back to the ultimate uh, destiny of my life, the calling of God on my life, and see if I should be doing it or not. I've got a little uh, saying in your margin there. Efficiency is doing the job right, and effectiveness is doing the right job right. Some days I can be very efficient. Man, I can be working so fast and so smooth, and everything is coming together, and the problem is I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm not doing the thing that I should be doing. Everybody ought to have a wife like my wife, Norma. Because she comes in sometimes and she says, Jim, is, is that what you should be doing right now? <laughs> I used to have a sign on my wall, and it said, is this what grown men do? Now, the fellow that gave me that uh, had gotten it from a golf course. <laughs> And some of you spend a lot of time playing golf, and that's great if you've decided, you know, how to do it. But it always seemed kind of funny to me to go, and I, I'm not a golfer, as you can tell, you know. But, and I'm sure there's some value in that. So don't, I'm, I'm not talking against golf. Maybe I should talk about fishing, okay? <laughs> no, let's see. Maybe, maybe I'll, I can't think of anything to talk about without stepping on somebody's toes. But that's a good question to ask myself. I, I ask myself that. Is this what grown men do? Just any time you find yourself doing this, is this what grown men do? I was sitting down at my computer the other night playing a computer game. And the very thought came to me, is this what grown men do? I wonder if Lauren Sandy's playing a computer game right now. I wonder if Bill Sleese is playing a computer game right now. I wonder if Roger Farr, John Crawford, is playing computer games right now. So I finished that game and turned it off. I did have to finish that game. I wanted to see how it came out. <laughs> Efficiency has to do with the question of how and how much, and effectiveness has to do the job of what and why, and those are the more significant questions to ask. Otherwise, we can be very good at doing the wrong thing. What was it, Einstein, that said we have a uh, perfection of means and a confusion of ends along that line? Let's look at an example, Acts 18. Do I have my glasses on? Yes, I do. This thing didn't quite look right. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> Acts 18, verse 19 to 21. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend some more time with them, he declined. So here's Paul. He gets an invitation. Would you like to spend some time with us? Now, most of us would appreciate an invitation like that. Someone calls us, and because of our spiritual maturity and our knowledge of, of the Bible and our walk with Christ, they say, would you like to spend some time with me? So they asked Paul, would you like to spend some time? And it says here, he declined, but he left. But no, excuse me, verse 21, but as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. But then he said, sail from Ephesus. So Paul had a, an idea of what to do, and it was according to God's will. 
He said, by the way, I will spend time if it is God's will. Maybe I ought to have that as a standard answer. Put it on a little three by five card by my phone and whenever anybody calls me and asks me a question, and I'll just say, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to do that if it's, if it's God's will. Rather than find myself getting sucked right into the uh, situation by the pressure of the moment. But let's look at the next big principle, and that's the area of priorities. <clears throat> when I first began to hear about priorities, um, it was told to me like this. There are three priorities. Uh, the first is God. And the second is family. And the third is work. That's the way it was that's why it was told to me. Oh. Now let me fix that so I don't keep goofing up on that one. There. God, family, and work. And it was kind of like uh, this is uh, uh, best, and this is better, and this is good. But the way of a lot of people actually thought of it, I honestly believe, is that this work is, is not actually good. It's more like a necessary evil. It's something that you, you have to do because you have to do it, otherwise you starve. But there was not a, a, a good sense about that. And I also had an idea from looking at this model of it. Always was very helpful to me. But I later have become to believe that this is not the most ideal model or perhaps the only way to look at this uh, issue. Because I had the idea that I've got to get this one perfected before I can move to this one, and I must get this one fully squared away before I can move to this one. So it was like a, a, a sequence of events. So I've got to get my relationship, my personal life, really squared away with God, and then I can begin to work on the family, and then I can begin to work on my career. Well, along about that time, a man named Bob Hage shared with me a, another thing. He had a circle. And he said, really, there are many things that have to go on sort of simultaneously, not sequentially. And he had this thing divided up into, oh, I don't know, maybe six or eight pieces. Uh, and he put Jesus Christ at the center and sort of controlling and involving in all of these. So he had the personal life over here and then the uh, family and work and uh, recreation, civic involvement, and church. And you could put as many pieces of pie as, as you wanted to in there. But the, the difference in that is that all of these things must be done simultaneously instead of sequentially. And Jesus Christ is not an item on the list that I can just sort of check off and say, well, yep, I got that one. But he is the list. He's involved in every aspect of all those activities. Well, as I've thought about this and, and simplifying, I, I would just like to leave, uh, leave something a little bit more simple with us today and just take those top three, personal, family, and work, and view it like a triathlon. Now, I know that Brady Sparks is sitting here, and maybe some of the rest of you are triathletes. A triathlon is three events. You have to ride your bicycle, swim, and run. Is it in that order, Brady? You run first? That's what I thought. I just thought I'd see if you were still awake. You swim first, and then you run, and then you bike. Oh, you swim, and then you bike. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Let me write this down. Let's see. You swim, and you bike. Have I got it right? And then you run. Now, to win and to be an effective triathlete, there are several issues, and I think it's a parallel for our work. So let's, let me just give you uh, about six issues that are important for a triathlon that relate to um, living our life and balancing these three things. First of all, to win, you must be skilled in all areas. Second, it takes different skills to swim, to bike, and to run. And to have a good person, effective personal life takes a different set of skills than having a good family life, which takes a different set of skills than doing, being effective in your career. A third uh, parallel I see is it takes continual training to be developed in those three areas. 
and it's a different kind of training. Two weekends ago, my wife and I attended a marriage seminar, a marriage conference. And you know, we've been married for 29 years, almost 30, and we've got a fairly good marriage, but we really needed some continual training to stay up to where we needed to be in our marriage life. Uh, the fourth uh, point is that every event affects every other event, or each event affects the others. For instance, you can't just go out and swim your heart out and give it all out. You've got to have something left for the biking. And you can't swim for all you're worth and then bike for all you're worth, and then you just have to walk the rest of the way. You need to sort of conserve energy and balance off those things uh, one against the other. So you strike a balance both in training and performance. Now, there is some ebb and flow in this. There'll be times, for instance, when you spend a little bit more time on your work than on your family. Sometimes when you spend more on the family than your personal life. So there's some ebb and flow like stages and seasons that go on in our life. But uh, each event does affect the others. Another uh, parallel I see is that the amount of time and effort varies according to the individual. For example, right now, uh, my wife and I are empty nesters. Our children are grown and gone and have families of their own. So we spend much less emotional strain and drain and, and focus on the family. But by the way, we still spend quite a bit of time because we're still raising our children to a certain extent and focusing on the grandchildren. But it's a different season of life for us. And so this effort uh, varies individually. Some people are natural uh, runners, but when they jump in the pool, they, they tend to sink like a brick. That, that'd be me. Bill Sleese is in the master's uh, training program down in swimming, gets up at 6 o'clock every morning or 5 o'clock and goes for a swim. He just swims like a fish. You know, and I, just, I couldn't do that. It would take a lot more effort for me to do passable in the swim event. And I believe the same thing is true in, our, in living our life before Christ as far as personal, family, and uh, work. The effort varies individually. And the last point is you can never be perfect in all uh, of these areas at once. But we can set goals and gradually improve. Marriage is a lifetime project. Someone said, Jim, how's your marriage? And I said, average. I'm trying to have an average marriage. I'm trying to have an average personal life, and I'm trying to be an average navigator. If I could be average in all those things, it'd be great. The problem is everybody wants to buy, get the best buy on their used car that anybody ever got and sell it higher than anybody else did, and we just can't live at that, at that pinnacle all the time. There's a certain sensibleness of, of uh, just being average. I don't mean to be content with something less than God can do through you, but to face the reality of the balance of these various priorities. Well, let's stand up for just a minute and move around. This is kind of sleepy time of afternoon. So let's stand up and stretch just for a minute. Okay, thanks. Let's get started again. Just as we pass off priorities, uh, notice that statement by Martin Luther. He had only two days on his calendar, today and that day, the day he went to be with Jesus. So he was not trying to live the past over again or fret too much about the future but get in his heart and mind what God wanted him to do that day in such a way that when that day came, he would be uh, ready. <clears throat> okay, the third uh, general principle is to limit our expectations. And I've just got the statement there, you'll never get it all done. Someone came to me one time, such a helpful thing. He said, Jim, do you suppose 
there will ever be a time in your life when you are able to read the Bible as much as you think you ought to? And I thought about that and I said, well, no, probably not. Do you think there's that, there'll ever become a time in your life when you'll be able to pray as much as you think you ought to? No. Do you think there'll ever be a time when you'll be able to spend as much time with your children as you think you ought to? Now, I don't know where this sort of ought to thing came from, but I had it in my heart and mind. And he went on through all the different things that come to me. Do you think you'll ever be able to play tennis as much as you would like to? No, sure, no, probably not. So I had to, to put up with the idea that I'll never get everything done. A missionary friend of mine has this on his wall. Each day I must choose to do a few things very well, some things fair, and many things not at all. He had to limit his expectations. Lauren Sandy told me this a few years ago. He said, most truly significant things are done by people who are busy, tired, and really don't feel all that well. <laughs> so I have to limit my expectations. Let me give you an, a, pers a practical example of this. Have any of you got a book at home that you bought and haven't finished reading? <laughs> well, let me hereby, as of February the 22nd, at, uh, let's see, I've got three different, uh, 1658 roughly, I give you permission to not finish reading that book. You can just write it down there. I don't have to finish reading that book. Jim Kennedy said so. In fact, one of the most helpful books I've ever read is called How to Read a Book. How many of you have read that book? By J. Mortimer Adler. How to Read a Book. And he'll help you... Uh, to, to understand that you don't have to read all the way through every book and how to read and get what's in a book out very, very quickly. I, I don't practice his techniques quite as well as I did when I read it the first time about two or three years ago, but I'm ready to read it again because I find myself getting bogged down. I want to be exposed to the ideas of other men, but all of a sudden that book becomes like my master. And I feel like, well, I've got to read through to the last page, you know. Some people say, well, I bought the book, therefore I have to read it. Did you ever buy a newspaper? You didn't read every word of that, did you? You just read the comics and the sports page, if you're like me, in the business section. You read what you need to read. Same with books. You'll never get it all done. Limit expectations. The next is selectivity, and some of you know where I got this idea, differentiate between the urgent and the important. There's a little book that called The Tyranny of the Urgent. I read that book about three times a year because I really need to hear what he has to say. And he says we need to learn to distinguish between the urgent and the important. So would you take just a minute to list something there in your handout that is urgent in your life right now, but it's not important in the overall scope of human uh, events, and also list something there that is important, really important, but it's not very urgent. It's not calling you on the phone. It's not pushing you. There's not that sense of urgency somehow in your own mind. So would you take uh, just a minute and write that down? Let me call your attention to the saying that's in the margin beside this point of selectivity. This is attributed to Dawson Trotman. I personally didn't hear him say it, but I've read it. Don't do what others 
can do and will do when there are so many things others cannot do and will not do. And I can't tell you what a change has come over my life in the last 10 years in finding out what I believe it would be my unique contribution in the body of Christ and focusing on that and letting go of lots of other things that are really good things to do because there are others who can do and will do those things. But there are some things that no one else can do but me. And there's some other things that others maybe don't have a sense of calling to do the way I have to do them. So do those things that others cannot do and will not do, and you'll find your life is much more thrilling and acceptable to you. Okay, the fifth point is to operate with a margin. <clears throat> to operate with a margin. Psalm 127.2 says that God wants his loved ones to have their sleep to leave a little leeway uh, in your schedule. Remember the picture of the fellow who was just too tight, wound up like a spring. Operate with a margin. It will have something in the pointers that brings out a, a specific way which I found to do that. But part of this for me is to balance my intake and my output. I find that when I really get stressed out, it's because one of the other of those is not quite right, either too much uh, intake and not enough output, which is seldom for me, more likely too much output and not enough intake. Certainly I was uh, challenged and rebuked and instructed by Leroy's uh, uh, when he talked about the significance of the devotional life. Because that's an area where I find it's just so easy for me to get up and start doing God's work and not have any time for God himself. And then I wonder why about 2 o'clock in the afternoon I'm getting sick and tired of it. Sometimes it takes me to 4 o'clock. But a balance of the intake and output. If your output exceeds your intake, your upkeep will be your downfall. I love that. Unless my time schedule reflects a balanced lifestyle, the consequences of my imbalance will demand my attention later. Number six is to be a finisher. I don't want to say too much about that because it hurts me too much. I don't know how many unfinished projects I've got around my house. 2 Corinthians 8, 10, and 11 from the Living Bible. I've got the first part of it uh, written there in the margin. I want to suggest that you finish what you started to do a year ago. How many of you started something a year ago and it's not yet finished? Go ahead, put your hand up. That's, I feel a little better now. I want to suggest that you finish what you started to do a year ago for you were not only the first to propose that idea but the first to begin doing something about it. Having started the ball rolling so enthusiastically, you should carry the project through to completion just as gladly, giving whatever you can out of whatever you have. Let your enthusiastic idea at the start be equaled by your realistic action now. 2 Corinthians 8, 10, and 11 from the Living Bible. Ecclesiastes says, finishing is better than starting. My wife is pretty good about this too. When I get ready to start a new project, she says, well, uh, which one are you going to quit doing when you start doing this new one? And it's like I, I have a place there in my heart or in my life or in my focus of energy for, for about one project. And if I'm going to put something else in there, I've got to get rid of that one first. And it's, it's just been really helpful to me. But this is still a great uh, urgent need of mine. So many, so many unfinished uh, projects. And this weighs me down, causes me to get behind the eight ball, affects my discipline in other areas. And then the seventh one is uh, accountability. Having some sense, a very important principle for you to have some sense of being accountable to someone about the way you use your time. Maybe you could get together with someone weekly, as I do, and we give a little report. Well, how did you do on using your time this week? Good? Bad, poor, medium? Can, what can I pray for you about? Some degree of accountability. And it really helps. There's a little bit of sting to that, especially when the report's bad. But I can't wait to be asked when the report's good. And either way, it's helpful, whether I need it or don't. It's a benefit. Well, let's practice accountability. I want you to turn to, to a different neighbor, if you can, than the one you talked to last time. Uh, and talk about what you wrote in number four 
and get his idea on how you might improve that. Okay? So you just wrote it in number four. It was all secret, and it probably didn't sting you very much to write that down in secret. But I want you to experience accountability by sharing that with your neighbor in groups of two, and then get his comment on what you might be able to do to uh, improve that important and urgent uh, quandary that you're in. And we'll take five minutes to discuss this, so enjoy your time with each other. Okay. Well, how did you enjoy that accountability time of just sharing with a, a stranger in many cases, right? Was it helpful? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it stings a little bit to, to admit failures, especially when we're grown, we're, you know, successful in a career or uh, we've got children, and, and yet we realize that we're still growing and struggling and have needs. And, uh, and I found it just very helpful to admit specific problems and look to others for their help. Because, uh, you know, I don't know too much about nuclear physics, but if there was a nuclear physicist here, you and I know more together about nuclear physics than you know by yourself. Brady Sparks is a, a friend of mine who's a lawyer, and he knows an awful lot about law. I don't know much, but together, Brady and I know more about law than Brady knows by himself. So I can help him, and you can help me. We can help each other. It's excellent to have that opportunity for accountability. One of the things I want to encourage you to do as a result of our time today is just kind of a follow-on uh, assignment, a, a follow-on challenge, is to find some kind of accountability weekly for the way you use your time. And I see Paul Utenich sitting back here. He's pastor of a church. That'd be about the worst thing uh, in, my, in my view because everybody thinks you're real important, but they don't know what you do. And so just go up and, and just get with a group of men. And I know he has a close relationship with men in his church and and uh, freely uh, admit and look for accountability in the way he uses his time. No telling uh, how that might benefit all of, the, all of the church. Well, the last point under principle is uh, uh, uses for time. What are some verbs that you frequently hear uh, about what a person can do with time? Spend time. What's another? Save. Waste. Now, these are all words that we also use with money. You can spend money, you can invest money, you can waste money. And here are six words that, uh, that I've thought of that we can do with time. We can waste, mon uh, waste yeah, money, we can waste time, we can spend time, we can invest time, we can buy time, save time, and store time. Well, I think we all know how to waste time. We're probably pretty good at that. And we know how to spend time. See, when you waste it, you, you got nothing for it. When you spend it, at least you got your money's worth. How can you invest time? Okay, invest in other people's lives. I heard Leroy, uh, I think it was Leroy, talk about uh, teaching his son how to uh, tie a tie. Because every Sunday, he'd have to tie the boy's tie for him. He taught him how to tie it, and that was a way of investing some time because he got benefits coming back to the other side. And investment is where you get a return on that investment. So teaching your children to do any kind of a job is an investment in time. It takes a little bit longer to teach your, your son how to do something, but then the next time he can do it himself. And, of course, investing your life in the life of others, especially if you disciple them to disciple others, then that's a way of investing time. How about uh, saving time? What's an idea you found to save time? Just as here a few. All right. Found a way to save time. I like that. That's good and practical. A fellow told me one time, he said, I, I found I can save time by shaving in the shower. So I shave in the shower, and, that's, and I save a little time by doing that. Uh, and for various reasons. You'd have to know how I shaved to probably understand that. Who else had one here? Yes. Don't shave. Don't shave. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got the idea, right? Might just half shave, right? <laughs> so. All right, some other ideas. Just like that, just quickly. Drive fast, yeah. Unless there's a policeman there. So you need to buy those little radar things. Yeah, right, drive fast. 
I moved into Boston and I asked the man who was the landlord of the house I lived in how to get from this place to another place. And he told me how to go and I went that way for about six months and one day I thought, I wonder if there's a better way. And I found out the way he told me was about twice as far as another way. I don't know if you've been in Boston, but the streets look like spaghetti, you know, just, they just go every which way. So I came back and I told him about this faster way to get there. And it's a place we'd go all the time, I have the grocery store, post office or something. He didn't believe me because he'd been going that way. But, you know, some research and just little driving patterns. Yeah. Neil. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, how about uh, buying time? What I mean by this is that you can let other people do things. And delegating is an idea of buying time. But you can buy time by having electrical appliances uh, to do things. Like if you want to chop up an onion, you can do that a whole lot quicker with an onion chopper than you can buy and with less tears than you can with a knife. And all of us have a lot of, uh, of electrical appliances. When I grew up, my mother had a washing machine that was very manual and it was out behind the house. And uh, so she just did laundry on Monday. And that's all she did on Monday because it took all day to do the laundry. Now some of you who are a little older than me, maybe you had to actually build a fire to heat the water to do the laundry. I mean, so you had to start on Sunday night to do the laundry all day. Now what do we do? As we're walking out of the house, we kind of do a, you know, a shot and put the stuff in there and hit a couple of buttons, and we've all found ways to buy time. I buy time with that uh, Jiffy Loop or one of those places where you can, uh, you know, so that you can buy time. This last concept was a little unique to me, though, the other day when John Crawford shared it with me, and that is you can store time. It's a little bit like saving time, but it is storing up time. And when I first heard that, I thought, no way. But then as I thought about it, sure enough. For example, when I file papers, I'm storing time so I don't have to search. When I first started getting papers, I just throw them in a box. Well, first of all, it's on the desk. When the desk got so bad, then I thought, well, I'll get me a box. So I got a box and I just filed all the papers in the box. You know, bills, notes, anything, letters from my grandmother, whatever, just throw it in the box. But every time I want something, guess what? You've got to look... Then I had about six or seven boxes. Then I have to know which box it's in. And so I have to look through all six or seven boxes. And, uh, and I, I did that for so many years that even now I, I tend to look through the stack rather than look in the file. And most of the time it's in the file where it should be. So when I get back to Dallas on Sunday, I'll take these notes on use of time and I'll file it into a filing system in the appropriate place. So next time, if ever, I want to look at these ideas again or to be reminded, or to share with someone, I should be able to just go and say, and, and I've stored time by filing those things away. Understand? One of the most effective ways to store time is to memorize Scripture. If the Scripture is in you and can be called out by the Holy Spirit to help apply into another man's life, you've stored up time. Or if you're preparing a message or preparing a talk or preparing to meet with someone, Memorize scripture is a way to store time. Just a good concept for you to think about, how to store time. Okay, let's turn the page and look at some pointers. We'll move a little faster through this material. The first one is to have one system only for planning and scheduling for keeping track of your days. Uh, let's hear a system that some of you guys use. Who, who, who uses some kind of a system? What do, you, what do you call it, or what's it called? Pardon? Random, Random system? Yeah, OK. <laughs> As in none? No, it's much more Oh, I see, yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, Bruce. OK, Bruce uses day timer. And that, you can order that. And they've got all sorts of neat little ideas associated in with that, especially if you read that little booklet, how to get the most out of your day timer. All right, what's another system that someone uses? A do list, all right. Another. A card file, another. A seven star diary, another. Franklin. Now about a year ago I was acquainted with Franklin. I haven't, got, haven't saved up enough money to buy it yet, but I did listen to the tapes. And uh, here's a fellow from Salt Lake City who has got a, a system that really Sounds good. Brady has it, don't you, Brady? The Franklin system. So there are a lot of these systems out there. 
but my encouragement in, in having a system is also to have only one system. So about two years ago, I'd heard of several good systems. So I had about three different things going. I had a day timer, and I had a calendar on the wall, my wife, you know, and we had about four different places to write things down. And after about three missed double books and all that kind of stuff, we said, wait a minute, we got to get this down to one thing that we can stick with that'll help us. <clears throat> Second point is learn to say what? That's right. Oh, you already knew that. See, I wasted our time there. In fact, let's practice it one more time. One, two, three, no. Maybe we could do a little bit more. I mean, you know, this is not a pep rally or anything, but just a little bit more convincing. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three, no. no. Oh, boy, that's got it. <laughs> to say no to one thing is to say yes to another thing, and vice versa. To say yes to something is to say no to something else. So if you're going to say yes to watching a television program for the next 60 minutes, it's to say no to other kind of meaningful interaction you can have with your wife or your children. To say yes to come to this conference means, no, I'm not going to be with my wife over this weekend. So it's, it's just a really interesting little uh, binary system, a dichotomy that I've, that I've tried to be aware of. When I say yes to something, I'm saying no to something. Something to keep in mind. In fact, some of you are going to go to workshops and messages and have talks with people, and you're going to come out with a list of about 10 things that you want to do starting Sunday when you get back home. But guess what? You're not going to be able, because you're already using 24 hours of every day. So when you make that list of something you like to start, you're also going to have to make a list of something you're going to stop in order to have time to do that thing that God has told you to start. And if God didn't also show you something to stop, maybe it's not God at all that's telling you to start that, but you're just trying to kind of make the team or to show off. So be careful how you come to a conference like this and take on a great big list of things that that you want to do to, uh, let's say, maybe even to impress someone. Third idea under pointers is to schedule into your life each day divine interruptions. When I schedule my time, I put a little block called DI. Every day, I'll schedule a little block, 30 minutes to an hour of DI, divine interruptions. That's when God sends something into my life. I don't know what it's going to be at the start of the day, but I know he's going to send something there and I've got to allow time for it. And if I don't allow time for it, I have to say to the fellow, I'm sorry I can't talk to you on the phone right now. Or I'm sorry I can't drop by. I'm sorry we can't do this or that. Divine interruptions scheduled into your day each day. The next is to divide tasks. You've heard you can eat an elephant one bite at a time. Remember the story of Moses in Exodus 18? And his father-in-law came out and said, what you're doing is not good for you. You and the people with you will wear yourselves out. The thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to perform it alone. So divide down tasks and delegate when you can. And if you can't delegate, at least sort of delegate to yourself. Divide the task down into bite-sized pieces and then assign those pieces to yourself at the appropriate time. I'm pretty good at lining out the work of other people. So the little game I play with myself is I line out the work and I divide it into pieces and then I turn around and become my own boss and say, okay, Jim, now do this part. And just breaking it down that way and assigning those pieces to myself to do helps me to get going on it. Because I tend to look at the giganticness of it and just don't bite. But once I get it broken down into bite-sized pieces, then I can just pick up the size that's nibbleable and fit it into a, to this point in time. Now, if you're like me, you tend to, to do the unimportant things before the important things. Because you say, well, I'd like to get all these unimportant things out of the way so I can do the, my quality time on this really important thing. But if you've only got five minutes, you ought to be doing those five minutes of effort on the most important thing that there is for you to be doing in your life rather than doing this sort of insignificant and meaningless thing. I've got a drawer in my file, my desk, this kind of the ready stuff. I've got a filing cabinet, which has, you know, sort of historical and other things, but I've got sort of current stuff over here. And I've got a drawer, and I put stuff in there that's kind of C-rated projects. And I just wait till somebody calls me on it. And if nobody ever calls me or writes me or asks me about it, and when that drawer gets completely full, I just throw the whole thing out and don't look at it. Because a lot of things, I, I, you know, kind of pass me that I don't really need to do. If I just answered the mail every day, that's all I would, and the telephone, that's all I'd ever get done. I could never be proactive just to answer the phone and answer the telephone. 
I mean, answer the mail and answer the telephone. So I, uh, it helps me to assign myself work to become my own boss. Everybody ought to always want to be your own boss. This is your chance. Assign yourself those projects. The next is duplexing, learning to do two things at once. I've already mentioned taking a shower and shaving. Another is uh, driving and doing scripture memory. So as I'm driving to, to uh, an appointment, I've got my verses in my hands and I'm doing, and I, I'm holding the steering wheel and with my fingers, I'm moving the next verse up to see what it is and I, and I review verses as I'm driving. I've been doing that for 20 years and I've only had two wrecks doing that. <laughs> I haven't had a wreck for about 10 years now. So it's probably about time for another one. But I figured that's a bargain, two wrecks and no one was killed in either one of those wrecks. Uh, reviewing scripture as I, as I drive the car. John Crawford digs his garden and meditates. You wonder where John Crawford gets all those good ideas he comes up with? It's while he's out digging his garden. So maybe you ought to go dig his garden. I don't know. There's something in the garden. I don't know what it is. But that's, that's something he does. Another is to take someone with you when you go someplace. What's another idea from the room? Some, a way you found to do two things at once. Just listen to it. Huh. Yeah. Where do you get the tape? A 30-second loop tape. Just for cassette. I, I never heard of such a thing. Great idea. Okay, what's another thing you found you can do two things at once? Do what? And do dishes? Now, first of all, how many of you men do dishes? Oh, that's another thing I'm going to have to do or I'm going to be guilty. <laughs> do the dishes. I knew I'd be sorry I came here today. Do the dishes and make phone calls. Yeah. I, I talked to somebody this week, and his, his two things at once was to uh, type letters on his computer and talk to me on the phone. And he had an IBM keyboard, which goes clackety, clackety, clack. And so I'm sitting here trying to think about what we're talking about. He's going, and uh, I'll see you about Tuesday, about six. You know, I finally had to say, well, I'll talk to you later. I couldn't stand it. You know what I mean? So maybe there are some times when you can't, you know, you could uh, over apply that. One, okay. Someone said, take a shower and spend time with your wife. So, I think, uh, I think that's another workshop. However, uh, one on. Moral purity or something. So check that out. I, Neil's laughing so funny. I, he, he's the one that told me that. <laughs> Quality time, yeah. Don't hop around. Don't be a grasshopper when it comes to projects. One day I went, when I was in the computer business, I went to work and I was thinking a lot about the use of my time and I, I took, took uh, uh, some records, took some notes at about 10 o'clock in the morning and realized that I had started without finishing 13 different little projects. So I started something and I, and I needed a piece of paper out of my desk drawer to, to sort of do the next thing on that piece of paper. So I opened the desk drawer and ah, saw something that needed to be done yesterday. So I bring it up and I start to dial the guy on the phone and I get halfway through and I think of somebody else's phone number that's just about the same that I need to call worse than him. So I call that guy, and while I'm talking to him, he says, would you look up something? So I go over to the file cabinet, pull open the door, and see something else in there. And I did 13 different things without finishing anything. And for me, that's, that's a real, uh, a, a real um, drain. I probably should have put that down under leaks, come to think of it, to, to, to hop around. Gene Ward told me one time that uh, uh, people like that are like grasshoppers. They ought to be smashed out, <laughs> stomped, or something like that. I don't know if he was talking about me or not. Uh, he didn't say so. Yeah. Yes, sir. There you go. Yeah. Yep, that's right. You forget which one you're pressing? My father uh, is 81 years old, and he has one of those memory phones, and he was trying to save a little time because every day he calls two different ladies to wake them up. My mother died last August, and uh, so he's living on his own, and he, he got to thinking, what if, 
what if I died during the night and nobody knows about it? What if I was in bad trouble? So he got this idea to call up, and notice he just called ladies. He didn't call any other men. I thought that was kind of unique. But uh, one of these ladies became kind of a sweetheart to him. And uh, in fact, to hear him talk about his uh, sweetheart is just the cutest thing. They're like two third graders. They're just in love. And uh, so I uh, was talking to him one day, and he said, well, I, I, I went to call Clois the other day, and I accidentally pressed the wrong button on my, on my dialer. <laughs> and he called this other lady that he calls every day to see if she made it through the night. They call each other between 8.15 and 8.30. And, and if one doesn't call, if he forgets to call her, then she has to call him at 8.30, see if they made it through the night. Now, if you're not 80, you don't understand these kind of things. My mother used to read the obituary every day to make sure she was still alive or not. So anyway, he, he, instead of calling Clois, he called uh, Mary. And he didn't wait for Mary to say anything. He says, honey, uh, what are you going to wear tonight? Are you going to wear what you wore last night or are you going to wear something else? You sure wear pretty. And uh, Mary says, who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> so if you're going to use one of those, let the other guy say hello at least before you start talking. <laughs> know what you're talking about. The seventh and last pointer here is uh, to preserve windfalls. This means that, for example, when you get a windfall of time, use it for a precious possibility rather than squander it. Yesterday, I uh, normally meet on Thursdays with a uh, Bible study group at noon. And yesterday, for a variety of reasons, it just collapsed. There were only two of us that could make it, so we did a command decision and decided not to have it. So all of a sudden, here's a windfall. It takes me about... Uh, two hours, maybe two and a half altogether to, to do that Bible study from the time I leave my office, get to the Bible study, attend the Bible study, and get back to my office again. Somewhere about, so here's a two and a half hour windfall. So I thought, boy, what can I do with this? I can just, you know, and I thought immediately, wait a minute, I'm going to be talking on Saturday about, or Friday, about using our time wisely. So this principle just came to mind, preserve windfalls. And I preserved it by doing something very significant and meaningful. I did about three things, but one of them was to take my wife out to lunch. And uh, I don't make a habit of doing that. I should, shame on me, but she really loved it. Uh, we went down to Chili's and had a big burger and it was just the, the neatest thing. But I preserved that windfall by doing something very significant uh, with it. One night, uh, uh, some couples came for Bible study. And uh, I mean, we had a couple's Bible study, but on this particular night, only one couple came. And Jay and Mary Ann Fell. You might remember Jay, he's been here at the men's conference, but now he's a navigator staff working up in New York City, uh, ministering to Jews. He himself is a converted Jew, a very serious individual. So they came to Bible study, and uh, there was no one else there, and I, you know, I couldn't think what to do, and we're sitting there looking at each other, and we knew it was just the four of us. So I said, well, I tell you what, let's do, let's, um, let's, uh, let's play dominoes. You all know how to play dominoes? And Mary Ann, who's even more serious than Jay, she, her mouth fell open about this big, you know, and she played dominoes. She thought we were going to do something holy and spiritual and wonderful and deep and significant. So we got out the dominoes and uh, played dominoes for about an hour, and they just loved it. And you know now when Jay and Mary Ann talk about those wonderful times they spent with Jim and Norma, one of the first things that gets mentioned is dominoes. Because we, we, we're, by doing that sort of casual, fun thing, we broke into a whole area of relating that we hadn't. We'd been relating mostly on God's Word and evangelism and discipleship. And it spread our relationship and it spread our association, our fellowship into a different area. It was a wonderful, wonderful way to preserve a windfall. So there you go, play dominoes or whatever it might be. You have great opportunities to practice this uh, with your children. But I'd like to uh, get you to engage in an exercise, and I, I, one of the things I want, to, I want to assign you as an ongoing project as a result of our time together is to look in the Bible for principles of how to use your time and to study that. Of course, Proverbs is very rich in this, but you'll find some situations which are very effective uh, throughout the Old and New Testament. One of the ones that I found was uh, regarding this one on don't hop from 1 Kings 20, 40 where the prophet talked to Ahab and he says, while your servant was busy here and there, the man disappeared. 
Remember that story? He was assigned to guard a prisoner. It's a fictitious story, but he was making a point with Ahab. He was assigned to guard a prisoner and let the prisoner get away. And his excuse was, well, while your servant was busy here and there, the man disappeared. Well, I memorized that uh, principle, and it has guided me significantly in getting busy here and there, kind of hopping around from one thing to another and letting the main event go down the drain. So I want us to do a little exercise here for the next eight minutes. Uh, down under practice, you'll see the passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 9. And I'd like for us to just get in groups of three where we can, start, re read a verse, and then list a principle or an idea about how to use your time in your life from, those, from that short passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 9, groups of three, eight minutes. I'll give you a warning when you've got a minute to go. This is an example of the kind of uh, research. Uh, I expect that just from the buzzing that I heard that you found uh, several significant principles. Just let me share you some of the ones I've seen. Uh, first of all, he combined errands. He would go see them because he was in that area already. I'm going through Macedonia. Another is in, from verse 6 is flexibility. Perhaps I will stay. His choices were not fixed ahead of time. Uh, number 7 is quality uh, from verse 7. He didn't want to make just a passing visit. There's another one of my alarms. This one has three alarms, by the way, so you can really get yourself on time. Uh, also from verse 7, the concept of sovereignty, if the Lord permits. I appreciate about some friends of mine, they frequently preface their plans with if the Lord wills or Lord willing. And that's a thoroughly biblical uh, way to think. From verse 9, opportunity. There was a door for effective work, and that helped him to decide how he would spend his time. And finally, the principle from verse 9 of opposition. It's not always wise to avoid difficult situations. Because Paul said, yeah, this must be God's will because there are these people that are opposing me. That's kind of the way Paul looked at it. Well, let's look briefly at these uh, leaks that we can plug. I've written some notes down here for you. Uh, procrastination is essentially uh, inability to make a decision. Let me encourage you to analyze your decision-making process to find out how, where, how you're doing on it, where you're going wrong, how things look. More men are rendered ineffective by lack of decision than by poor decisions. It's better to go ahead and make the decision and then make it right uh, under God's hand as you've prayed uh, uh, faithfully and sought the advice of counselors. But this is a great problem of mine, procrastination, which is inability to make a decision. Second is none or poor planning. Proverbs 16, 9 says we should make plans counting on God to direct us. Then overscheduling. I don't know how many times I've thought, well, I've got about 10 minutes and I start a job that would always take at least 20. And it runs me late getting to a meeting. And I'll come up with some lame brain excuse about, well, I had you know, a phone call come in at the last minute or some such thing. And if I had 10 cents for every one of those lame brain excuses I've tried to pass off on people, I'd be a rich man today. And it's because I try to overschedule. I try to cram too much in. That's a noble to try to get a lot done, but it's unwise. Romans 10.2 is a good verse for me on that. I bear them witness that they have a certain zeal and enthusiasm for God, but it is not enlightened and according to correct and vital knowledge. Proverbs 19.2 says uh, to be uh, over hasty is to sin and miss the mark. There's another part of it I, I left off, didn't I, Gene? Um, can't remember the first part of it. But to be over hasty is to sin and miss the mark, putting too much into our, into our lives. And others, interruptions. We train people to interrupt us. I just put the telephone down there. The telephone is a major interrupter. There's nothing wrong at all with not answering your phone. Um, I'm not at the whim of anybody out there in the world who happens to know my telephone number at this point in time. So um, um, an answering machine comes in real handy. You can just take the message and call back later. A friend of mine takes all messages from 9 to 11, talks to no one, unless it's you know, his wife or an emergency, and then he calls everybody back at 11. That's a pretty good way he found to avoid interruptions and uh, redeem the time. Then tyranny of the urgent. We've already really talked about uh, that one. And then tyranny of the expectations of other people. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. 
John 12, 42 and 43 finishes by saying, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And faulty priorities, of course, Matthew 6, 33, and we've talked earlier about how our priorities match uh, and how those things should be uh, thought through. Then worry. Matthew 6, uh, 24 says specifically, do not worry. And we have a certain amount of emotional energy and we can either funnel that into work or we can funnel into worry. And work is a lot more fun and it's more healthy for you also. So these are some of the leaks that uh, tend to drain us. One last idea I would like to suggest is to read something every year uh, from the secular literature about how to use your time. One of the most effective books I've found is called How to Get Control of Your Time and Your Life. But there are many. Every year there's another hot one out there. But take some time and read that. You don't necessarily need to read it all the way through, but read the kernels out of it and get a few ideas. You'll find it's more of a refresher than new information, but it'll be a shot in the arm. Then also read the Bible looking for these things and uh, find yourself some accountability. Ed, question. Yes. Yes. Even though he's a Mormon, it's an excellent book. And uh, I've read most of it. I didn't read all of it, but I, I think I gained from it. It's an excellent book. Thanks for mentioning that, Ed. Any uh, questions? We've got a couple of minutes left before we uh, adjourn. Stephen Covey? C-O-V-E-Y, I believe, is it? It's uh, kind of a bestseller. It'd be at B. Dalton's or any of those places. C-O-V-E-Y. It came out really, what, Ed, probably... About two years ago, maybe, or? Okay. Okay, any questions or comments about using our time? Yes. because your time's worth more than $10 an hour. That's a very good concept, Mike. Thanks for sharing that. Other comment or question? Okay. Yeah. Or other kind of stationary uh, exercise equipment, like a, uh, a bicycle or the stair machines. You're paying a man there for a minimum wage, and you have opportunity to make more than minimum wage, most of us. So, and he can do it three times faster, and he gets it right. That's a good one. That's a good one, Ralph. Well, that's 5.50. Time is up. Let me pray, and we'll go to the next activity. Father, thank you for helping us get the most out of this particular time, and I pray that there would no, be no one going out of here with a sense of guilt that you didn't intend. Um, but a sense of joy at just the fruitful way in which you can guide us into the most significant implementation of the particular resource, the particular life that you've given us to have on this earth. Thank you so much for those who have gone before us and invested their life into us. I pray that our lives might, be, might make that a truly an investment and not a waste, that we might continue to bear fruit and reproduce. I thank you, Father, that you've given each of us in this room a sense of vision, of destiny, of what our life needs to be and can be. And I pray that as we walk hand in hand with you,